and now I'm going to go into what I actually want to talk about. So I'm actually writing what I want to talk about on the board in hopes that we'll get there sooner than page 15. Yeah. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 9. This is a question, this verse I get questions on about once or twice a year. And so because of that, I thought maybe it would be a good idea to talk about it a little bit. Romans chapter 9. much for him. Romans 9 verse 19. Okay. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? I, I didn't know where exactly to start because there's like this whole long ongoing thing. Uh, it talks about how in the beginning or in the first part like verse 17 for the scripture says to Pharaoh for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. God's talking about there how he hardened Pharaoh's heart. You guys know this, right? Several times in the whole experience of the children of Israel in Egypt. And God tells Moses, hey, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And, you know, if I were Moses, I'm like, okay, you tell me to let him go, and then you harden his heart. What's going on here? And it didn't just happen once or twice or three times. It happened like eight, nine, <laughs> a lot. Okay? And... The idea here is that he is going to explain a part of his nature here as it relates to what he did with Moses and Pharaoh and then goes into a, a verse that has been uh, not a stumbling block but a confusing one for a lot of people. So the context is, I have raised you up, Pharaoh, to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. Here is the desire of God in all of the plagues of Egypt prior to releasing the Israelites is that he wanted his fame to be known in all the earth. In the Old Testament, you'll see he wanted all of Egypt to see his wonders. He really wanted to show off. I mean, that's, a, that's a kind of selfish way of saying it, but he wanted people to know him. And he knew that the only way you were going to get people's attention, which is no different today than it was then, is to do something miraculous. I could stand here all day and tell you all of these great thoughts of God, but as soon as I laid my hands on someone without an arm and they grew an arm, that's what will be remembered tonight. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah. Even though maybe some of the things I teach are even more miraculous than that. Okay? Verse 18, so then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. <laughs> Very important. Okay? You will find, and I think it's probably the case for a lot of people, that you have found seasons of your life where you don't know why, but you're just grumpy. And sometimes you can blame yourself, and then sometimes you can actually say, hey, maybe the Lord's doing something in my heart. Pharaoh's probably wondering, I don't know why I keep telling this guy no. I mean, I'm watching my people get covered in boils. I'm watching another group of them get covered in frogs, and then the flies come. You know, after a while, you're like, how much more do I have to do? No, 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 we're not letting them go. <laughs> Do you, ever, do you ever get stubborn like that and not even really realize why you are? It could be because the Lord's involved. 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? In other words, if you're the one doing this, God, why do you then find fault? Okay. For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? Now here's the verse that brings a lot of people to me with a question. Verse 22. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience Vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Now, how many people have read that verse before? You've read that verse before, okay? And many times people will ask me this question, especially when I preach about the idea that God is a good God. 
and that he only creates good things, and he only creates people because he loves them and wants them to have a relationship with him forever. And I do talk that way. I still believe that, though this scripture is in the Bible. And verse 22 has a very, first of all, you have to read this in the context. What is the context? I just want to, I'm going to be third grade teacher here for a second. What's the context of this scripture? We just read it, so I'm asking you to kind of tell me what we just read. Okay, Pharaoh. What did he do with Pharaoh? Hard is hard. Did he create Pharaoh? Mm -hmm. But did he create him evil? No. No. What happened? Halfway through his life, somewhere along in his life, the Lord intervenes and does something with him for a purpose, right? Okay. So, same way here, we go down and then we see that he's talking about a molder and clay. Is the clay already existing on the yeah. potter's wheel? Yeah. It's already existing, right? And he decides, in the process of shaping the, the, the pot or the clay, he says, okay, I want to do something with this. Even to the point where he says this in verse, uh, end of 21, to make s from, s the, from the same lump, hello? That's a key phrase in there, from the same lump, in other words, the same clay, he makes one for honorable use and one for common use. You guys know that Aaron was made and he might have greater honor than Journey in this world. And it's not an unfair thing. It's not because God likes Aaron more than Journey or vice versa. It has to do with the fact that that is how he fashions things. He just does that. But I will tell you, when <coughs> heaven, you know, I'm really trying to get to stay on course. Okay. But when the day of heaven is reckoned, you will not be measured to the same standard he is. You will be measured to the standard he created you for. Okay? So though you might have walked with greater authority or greater responsibility or greater honor, she might have actually fulfilled more of what she was actually created to do than you did. Sure. You guys with me? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So though on, on earth, Aaron walked with great honor and Journey was just kind of the Martha. I'm just, this is just an example. It could actually be that she has greater honor once heaven rolls around. So could that go back to like predestination? Mm -hmm. the, where, you know, when God made him, he made him to do greater things than I will do. And, you know, some people you just... I, I think it has less to do with what you're going to do and how he designed you. All of this has to do with how he designed us. Okay. okay? I, I believe there's great works for every one of us to do. Particular to our design. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So it could be that a, a, a person is very well designed to do to be president of the United States, but never actually buys in, goes all in, invests all in to actually do it. Then he finds out at the end of his life, oh my gosh, I actually had that ability, yeah. that potential. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm going to stay on track. There's a lot of places I could go with that. That's not where I want to go. Where I want to go is this, because most people in verse 22 will come to me and say, Mark, God says it right here. He made certain ones for life. Hi, Natasha. How are you? It's good to see you. And one for destruction. Like there are actually certain ones that God makes in order for them to be destroyed. Okay? So let's look up this word for me because the, the, the word that is the the complex one, or the one that trips us up, is the word prepared. Does everybody have the word prepared there in verse mm -hmm. 22? Mm -hmm. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and make power known, endured with much patience, vessels of wrath prepared? Does everybody have that word there? Yep. Does anybody have a different word? Okay. So we're going to go with that word for a second, and I want you to look at that. Well, I'm going to look it up in the Greek for you. <laughs> Sure, I got the right word. There it is. All right, the word in the Greek is the word katartizo. And it's from two different words, but basically, the word means to thoroughly complete, repair, or adjust. Okay? So, if we go back and read that, I just want to read it again. It means to completely and thoroughly repair or adjust. If we go back and read this now. There we go. So, 
God, willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath, thoroughly, now I'm already forgetting what I already said, thoroughly complete and repaired or adjusted. Here's the idea. The idea is there are certain people that while they're in a process, while they're growing, while they're moving, God does not create them for destruction. <clears throat> He actually wields them in such a way for his purposes. Okay? So, if you go back and finish this, Romans 9. I have way too many tabs open here. I'm sorry. That's why I'm trying to. Hey Mark, in the Amplified, it actually uses the word ripe. What? Ripe. Ripe? Like a ripe fruit. Okay. So, the idea there is that it comes to fruition. Okay? The, the, the main point that people have a problem with here in this verse is the idea that God actually creates people from mm. birth for destruction. Okay? That's most of the time what I get is this question about this verse. And it's not the idea at all. The idea is that as people grow, as people develop, as people go through their life, a lot of the choices they make causes God then to make choices concerning them. Mm. Are you with me so far? Okay, so if, I'll, I'll use Katrina as the example. Katrina is 22-ish. Okay, so he's, she's making certain decisions, and we have to realize that we are working with a God of relationship. I think we've talked about the last couple of weeks, he's not a God of control. He's not a God of manipulation. He's not a God that kind of has all our whole life all planned out, and he just kind of moves us with these puppet strings to get us to his design purpose for final finish for us. Instead, he works with us. And as we make decisions, guess what he does? He alters sometimes. He grooves. He moves with us. And then as, as Aaron makes one decision or Katrina makes a decision, he moves with her and him and, and adjusts. That word adjust is actually in the word prepared, katartizo. It means to adjust. It means to change. It means to thoroughly complete based upon where the person is at that moment. It's entirely possible, as a result of decisions Katrina would make, that the Lord would actually bring her to a place where all of us, it would look like the worst thing in the world that's going on for Katrina. Destruction. Oh my gosh. If Katrina goes down that road, that's it. It's over. There's no turning back for her. And the reality is God's actually trying to bring everyone to what? Repentance. Has anybody ever hit rock bottom? Yeah? You know that everyone's rock bottom is the same rock? <laughs> it is. It's true. Every single person's rock bottom is Jesus. <laughs> saved or unsaved. The problem is many people are finding themselves building on sand instead of digging deep enough to get to rock. Mm -hmm. And so you have to sometimes go through sand. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, lay your foundation in sand. That's okay. You'll eventually find the rock. And I've, I've heard it said, and I think it's a very wise statement. Sometimes we just need to step back and let people fall all the way. He has created some to get all the way to that place of destruction so that there's a possibility of repentance. I believe that Pharaoh had an opportunity to repent. Could he even repented? I mean, if he had a re how did you guys see how he repented? He says, let my people go. Pharaoh goes, you know what? Okay, you're gone. How long were they gone before he repented? <laughs> He changed his mind. Yeah. If he well, changed his mind one way, do you think he had the possibility of changing his mind the other way? We just don't know the whole rest of the story of Pharaoh. We did know he died as the waters came down over. Yeah. Okay? The point of this here is that he endures with much patience vessels of wrath. Not any point in time is it mentioned here, or, or, or even the, the original language say, that Katrina was created as a vessel of wrath and prepared for a very specific destination of destruction. That's not the nature of the language here. He is, what he's saying is that he's enduring with much patience the decision she's making. And when you endure with much patience somebody, aren't you also working with them? Aren't you also hoping that they will change? Enduring with much, if you're not working with them, trust me, there's no endurance required. Right? If you're just like, you know what, hands off, I'm done, there's no involvement, you don't need endurance because you're not involved. God is, he, what Paul is saying here is that God is, 
deeply involved. He's shaping them, he's forming them, hoping to bring about the purpose that he had created them for. But it's still up to every single person whether or not to decide to do this. Remember what we talked about wrath meaning in the New Testament? Anybody remember what the Greek word was for wrath? Oh, God, uh, or, or gay. Hey, Nick yeah. Helmet. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. It's the skull cap, guys. That's what it is. Keeps all the, the stuff. Okay. Vessels of wrath. It doesn't mean that he created them with the intention of wrath. He means that I am enduring much, much patience. If you require much patience, what are you feeling on the inside? Right. I'm feeling some irritation, some anger, <clears throat> some frustration. Some what the heck is it going to take for them to get it? Okay? That's what he's talking about here. I'm working with Katrina. I'm working with, working with her. I believe God rolls his eyes. I do. Okay? And as he's working with her, he's enduring her with much patience. His wrath is toward her, not just his anger, but all of his zeal. We've learned what orge means. To shape her and form her so that the destruction isn't the final place. You guys with me? That's good. All right. I felt like I really needed to just explain that because I've gotten that question twice in 2013 and I never properly answered it. So there you go, everybody on video. Ben, you had a question? So um, the endurance isn't with the vessel of wrath. The endurance is with the destruction that the vessel of wrath is causing. No, I would say it's with the vessel. Okay. I would. I would say it's with you. He's enduring you. As you strive, well, what did Paul, uh, Paul, what did God say about man right before he started over with Noah? Mm -hmm. I will not strive with man, Any specifically longer. flesh. Any longer. Okay? I will not strive with flesh forever. That's why he actually limited man's years. Huh. He did. At that moment, he limited man's years to how many? <laughs> 120. Okay? They used to live. <laughs> Good old Methuselah, 960-something years old. I mean, you want to talk about striving with man. He was striving with man. He says, you know what? That's it. You and me, Holy Spirit. This is what we're going to do. 120 years, zap. Out of flesh, because I'm going to zap them. You think about this. That's what he was feeling like with Moses and Aaron. That's it. Just kill them all. And then he did it in the flood. And then he limits his years. Why? He doesn't want to strive with man forever. Does anybody want to strive with their child forever? No. No, we don't want to strive for We don't want to fight. Did you just see that? A child came in from each direction and then an adult grabbed him. <laughs> that was a perfect illustration of striving with flesh. <laughs> right now they are enduring vessels of wrath. Did I make sense with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Has anybody ever wondered about that scripture or am I just bringing it? Did you guys already all know that scripture? Got it figured out. I have a question about that. Okay, yeah. So, in uh, in Exodus, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. So that one in Romans, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. <coughs> but in eight, in, in Exodus eight, it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Okay. I, I think. So is the nine? I don't know. I, I guess I read it. I don't know. Where are you? I'm sorry. Are you in Exodus eight? Exodus eight. Okay, so you went to Exodus. Okay. Yeah. And um, I don't want to. I don't want to get off on a thing, but it says I read Exodus eight that it, that Pharaoh hardened his heart. So did God harden it, or Pharaoh harden it, or did God? Probably the, the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I think there are times where God actually will use our own hardening of heart to bring us to a place of softness. I know that sounds crazy. But sometimes God actually allows us and works with us in our path toward destruction. Okay, guys? I want to get... Is it Alicia Keys? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's my daughter. That's the only reason why I knew that. Sure, Mark. But I remember the very first prophetic word I ever got. I swear, I, I, this is it. I promise I'm going back on track in five minutes. Very first prophetic word I ever got, I was saved two weeks. And I come 
to this church, well, no, a little bit longer than that. I probably haven't saved the better part of a year, but I had never received any kind of spirit-filled ministry or anything like that. And I walk into this spirit-filled Mennonite church. Oh, Ooh. step back. And no one's wearing coverings or anything like that. It's a, it's a rocking place. They're singing, they're dancing, they're banging tambourines. And this guy calls me out of the crowd and calls me to the front. And the very first words of the prophecy, I'll never forget, you have led a righteous life yeah. and I'm thinking to myself no I have not because I knew how I was living and it took me years to see God's perspective in that. because for so long I would see unrighteousness as behaviors that were opposed to God's holiness that's not how God saw righteous life God saw it as a path of living that brought me to Him. I'm going to tell you something. I did some pretty nasty stuff. I was not living according to the purposes of God. But all of those things that I did actually brought me to a place where instead of my heart hardening, it actually brought me to a heart softening. The hardest hearts I've ever found on the planet come from people who think they're living good lives. The easiest people to work with are those who are banging their chest, like the guy in Scripture, saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. I can work with them. Gosh, they're easy to work with. It's the ones that think, you know what, I don't need God, I'm good. That's the hard heart. So I realized the Lord was actually taking me down a path that in everyone's eyes in this room, I can promise you, looks sinful, awful, and ugly. The Lord says, he's coming. Think about the prodigal son. Who looked like the worst of the two brothers? At the end. Of course, the prodigal son. But guess who came to himself? In the midst of his worst sin, in the midst of his destruction, who never actually came to a knowledge of the Father? The one staying in the house the whole time. You had all this all to yourself the whole time. You couldn't come to that in the presence of me. Sometimes you actually have to go hit rock right in the forehead before you actually see you guys with me? Yep. Make sense? Yep. All right. Any other questions on this? <clears throat> so the answer to your question, I think the answer is yes. I think you'll actually see in Exodus or other place where it says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And in some places you'll see that Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart. So I think it's a partnership. All right. You want to go there, Matt? We're going there. All right. You guys ready to move on? I want to finish up the talk about the flesh and the real us and the spirit. So let's go to Romans 8. I'm going to close some of my tabs so I don't get lost. Romans 8, verse 1. I would have to say Romans 8, the chapter, is probably one of my favorite chapters in Scripture. But I feel like it's, it's, a, it's a case study in how we're supposed to walk and what this life after salvation is. Is supposed to look like. Okay? All right. One of the most famous verses of the whole Bible. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Okay? That's our theme for 2014, in Him. Specifically tonight, we're going to talk about in Christ. The key to this understanding of no condemnation, the key to this walk we're about to walk through here for the next hour or so, has everything to do with the life in Christ. Okay? And my goal in 2014, this whole year, my goal is to paint such a clear picture for all of us of what this abstract term looks like. Because for most of us, this is abstract. I can't really get my head around this. It's just a religious term. It's just this spiritual term that everybody uses. Oh, yeah, we're in Him. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're in Him. What does that mean? I don't know. We're, we're in Him. Well, what does that look like? I don't know. Quit asking me. You know, we, we, I want to talk about this to the point where not only do you see it, you understand it, and the best part, you can live it. Walk in it. It becomes a part of who you are. Okay? So, everything about Romans 8. Just like Ephesians 4, just like Colossians, just like Ephesians 1, basically all of Ephesians, is all about life in Him, in Christ. So, where is there no condemnation? In Christ. In Christ. Where is there condemnation? Hello. Hello. 
All right, we're back to third grade here. But it's really that simple. So if you're experiencing condemnation, where are you not? In Christ. Ah. So if you're experiencing condemnation, guys, in any area of your life, it is one of those ding, 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 ding. I got to get back in Christ. It's not a geographical location, okay? You're going to find out it has nothing to do with where your body is. Has nothing to do, has no indication of how many times you go to church. Even Bible study, as cool as all of you are, you can be sitting here tonight taking notes, looking like you're really interested, and not being Christ. And that's not a judgment. That's actually a cry to all of you to get in. And we're going to, we're going to see what it actually means here. You had a question? Yeah, that's kind of silly, but what is condemnation exactly? Ah. Okay. At the risk of taking this train off the tracks, yeah. let's look up the word really quick, okay? What's the very first thing? There's two main re things that we do when we want to look up the meaning of something. Help me out. There's two main Bible study techniques. One is context. The other is original language. Thank you. All right, so condemnation, the actual Greek word. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's a Greek word. Katakrino. Katakrima. There's a couple different terms here. In other words, it means to judge against, to sentence someone guilty, to damn them. Okay? So when you are experiencing condemnation, you're experiencing judgment against yourself. Okay? There is judgment for you, and there's judgment against you. Are we right? Conviction, biblical conviction, is judgment for you. It actually brings life to you. So the Holy Spirit is in the world to convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. But if you are condemned about your sin, you actually feel like I'm a failure. I'm destroyed. God's not for me. God's not against me. That's condemnation. Conviction is, oh my gosh, my life is actually taking me off the course God has for my life. There's so much positivity. There's so much encouragement in conviction. There's so much, come this way. Conviction is very similar to positive correction. Where condemnation is, you're an idiot. You're an absolute idiot. How many times have you done the same thing wrong? It's never going to change. It's always going to be this way. You might as well just give up. Condemnation. Conviction. There's a better way. I can show you what it's like. Come over here. I want to show you what life could be like. Conviction. You guys see the difference? That sounds like Holy Spirit. This sounds like a devil. Okay? Yep. All right. So i got to close that tab. Uh-oh. Yeah, okay. Romans 8. Okay, we did verse 1. So now we're on verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life, where? In Christ, In Christ Jesus. Paul doesn't get away from this. He, I'm telling you, this is a theme Paul will use throughout all of his letters. Everything I'm writing to you, everything I'm talking about, comes from the fruit of the Spirit comes from being in the Spirit. So there's a law of the Spirit. Law of the Spirit. Oh, I don't like the word law, Mark. Law is not good. Oh, it is good. It is when there's a law of the Spirit. Remember he says in Hebrews, I write his law. He writes his law where? On our hearts. That's the kind of law that changes how we live. Changes how we think and feel about ourselves, about people, about God. This is the law he's talking about here. Has set you free from another law. Law of sin and death. All right, so before I go any further, let me draw my alien. <laughs> Anybody that draws pretty well? Your daughter. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, here we go. This is this is awful. All right. This is original me. 
And it's three weeks now I've been drawing the same thing. It's the one God originally thought about, designed, created, created in our like, His likeness and in His image. Okay? Then we have this other guy or gal, depending upon you, that we began to create outside of relationship with the Lord, right? And after a little while, if we continue this, we'll start to kind of create a crust. Okay, who's this? Flesh. Anybody remember? Flesh. Flesh. This is the flesh. So in the Bible, we're about to see it here several times, he's going to use the word flesh. This is the flesh. This flesh is a life built slowly over time based upon decisions, behaviors, and results. Hey, back there. You behave. <laughs> Thought there were spitballs flying back and forth back there. <laughs> this is the person you become, the behaviors that reflect the person you become as a result of living outside of relationship. The very first decision made in the flesh was made by Adam. When he said, you know what, Eve? I think this snake over here is right. I think the only reason why he doesn't want us to eat is because he doesn't want us to know everything he knows. Let's just go try this. Let's go see what happens. First decision made outside of relationship with God led to a lifestyle of relationship outside. Lifestyle outside of relationship. Okay? So, then there's this really cool third thing now. And this is my focus for the night, okay? We've talked a lot about this, and we've talked a lot about this, referring to the last couple of teachings. But now there's something fantastical. This is what we've all been waiting to live for. This is in Christ. Okay? Or in the Spirit. Okay? For me, Spirit, Christ, the same. Okay? He is you want to call the Spirit, remember how I used to call the Spirit unlimited Jesus? Mm -hmm. oh. Jesus without flesh, not being, able, not being limited by space and time and geography. Now, Jesus can go anywhere, move anywhere. Why? Because he's now Spirit. 100% Spirit, okay? So, that actually didn't turn out too bad. That's kind of how I saw it in my head, actually. All right, so now everything else we're reading here in Romans 8, then we're going to go to Galatians 5. I want you to have this in your head. This is all of us in this room. Okay, so back to verse 1, just to kind of keep up with this. When we experience condemnation, it's life lived not in Christ, but in the flesh. Do you see this? You, don't, you can't actually move outside of this. Hmm. Okay, once you're in Christ, you're in Christ. You can't, no, 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 you can't steal them from my hand, John 10. But what we can do is we can decide which one we're living in. Okay? I can decide. Original me makes our decision. I'm going to live in the flesh or I'm going to live in Christ. You guys with me so far? Mm -hmm. Alright. Here we go. Verse 3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh. Stop. Okay. So, you've got two laws working. You've got the law of the Spirit and you've got the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is strengthened, uh, I'm going to put S and D here, okay? Law of sin and death. It is strengthened or weakened in us by not how strong the law is here. How is it strengthened or weakened in us? So it's the flesh. <clears throat> by how strong our flesh is. Yeah. Okay? That's why I said to you, and I actually offended someone two weeks ago, and I'm okay with that, because I told them that I would much rather, was it just last week? I would much rather have us, instead of battling demonic spirits, the real victory over demonic spirits is not how many times you can punch them in the forehead and drive them back. The real destruction of an evil spirit is not giving them any place to take hold. That's right. That's the real battle in the heavenlies, the war in the heavenlies, Ephesians 6. The taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, Ephesians, okay? Or 2 Corinthians 10, okay? So, if you really want to see this law weaken in your life, don't fight against the law of sin and death. Reduce the amount of time you live in the flesh. In that relationship with you that's outside of relationship with God. You guys with me so far? Mm -hmm. I repeat myself a lot on purpose because I feel like there has been a lot of disconcerting teaching concerning this. So, 
Where does the law of the Spirit then have stronger and stronger activity in our life? Christ. Inside. Of course, inside Christ. Yeah. So, law of the Spirit works here. LOS <laughs> works here. So, the stronger, the more, we'll find out in a minute, the more our mind is set here, the more the law of the Spirit has a way, has its rule, has its reign in our lives. If we live here, I'm just ticked off today. I've just decided I'm going to be offended. What they said, I don't care if they didn't mean it, or I don't care if they just said it offhandedly. I take it personal, and I am offended now. You have just bolstered the strength of your flesh, and now the law of sin and death will start working with a greater authority in your life. It has no power over you unless you give it to it. You've heard this before. The enemy has no power in your life unless you give it power. That's right. It has been totally, completely, 100% destroyed on the cross. Right? right? The power of the enemy has been destroyed. Here's the problem. It, it can be easily given back by people who walk here. For every person on the planet that walks in their flesh, we re-give something that's destroyed power. Yeah. It's the opposite of the whole point of it is finished on the cross. Do you think it's possible to never walk in your flesh? Here on earth. Jesus did it. Yeah. I believe it can be possible because there's going to have to be some generation. Remember, there's, there's <laughs> the last enemy to overcome is what? Death. Death. 1 Corinthians 15. There is going to be a generation, Becky, I'm convinced of this. It might not be mine. I pray it would be. I pray it's my children's. It's somewhat soon that will eventually get to the place where this mystery is no longer a mystery. And I'm explaining to you a mystery. This is what it looks like in the spirit realm. When Holy Spirit's watching you, when demonic spirits are watching you, when God is looking at you, He is not seeing glasses on a face and a balding head. He is seeing this. And they are determining the amount of activity you're going to allow in their lives by how thick the membrane is of the flesh and how powerful your mind is set on the law of the Spirit of Christ. You guys with me? They know who to mess with and who not to. They do. And that's why Jesus walks in a room and he doesn't even address a spirit. And they rise up and they say, we know who you are. We can see you. We know that you don't have any of this. Please, whatever you do, have mercy on us. Because it's a person walking fully in the spirit. Wow, on the planet. Jesus, it wasn't, Jesus was not the only person that could walk that way. I believe he died a death so that we could eventually walk in the way he did. So... Do you think, like when it says in the Bible, come to me as little children, if we constantly thought as a little child, we would constantly live in the Christ? That's how you enter the kingdom. Okay. He says you cannot enter the kingdom except as a child. Mm -hmm. Or you cannot receive the kingdom except as a child. I think okay. that's where it starts. However, there is a childlike faith you never lose. Yet there's also a call in Ephesians 4 and other places to walk in a maturity. 1 Corinthians 13. When I was a child, I did childish things. Mm -hmm. But when I matured, when I became an adult, I threw away childish things. I think it's a both. And that's why I love a Jocelyn Pence. Mm -hmm. Who can walk into maturity, yet completely be a kid. It's beautiful. I think we all need to be there. All right? I think adulthood and all the responsibilities of life squash that childlike faith you're talking about. Would you agree? Yeah, because yeah. when I act like a kid, I feel foolish. Yeah, you know why? Because there's a bunch of adults that have convinced you, judged you, or around you. Oh, no, no, i got to straighten up. Dream. Imagine. One of the greatest things about a child is that they imagine. And that, your imagination is the doorway oh, to the spirit. There are certain people in this room that just dream on a regular basis. And I'm just talking about like bad pizza dreams. I'm talking about <laughs> dreams like wow dreams. Like this girl probably gives me a dream that she has a couple times a week. And I'm like, I get those maybe once a month. And I realize it's because I'm still walking too much like an adult. Or she's still a kid. And that is not a, that's not a cut. That's actually honor. Could you imagine if we all daydreamed appropriately? Hmm. When we teach many people how to see into the spirit, have visions, have dreams, have revelations, have trances. Do you guys know a trance is biblical? 
You can be in a trance and see incredible things, and it's all the Lord. But it's going to take quite a bit of shedding some adulthood, shedding your responsibilities, shedding your, oh, I'm too, I'm a big boy now. I don't doodle on the sides of my papers. <laughs> I'm serious. There's a certain aspect of child that, that's very important, so thank you. Keep going. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, right? How, the, the law, okay, now there's a third law, but it's not really a third law, it's the same law. The law of sin and death, he's actually equating, this is crazy, Moses would, Moses would never have thought this until now. He's actually talking about the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. The law, Paul talks about this, he said it actually was a tutor that brought us to Christ. Okay? So, go ahead. Try to do it on your own. <clears throat> Try to fulfill the law on your own. You'll find out you just keep tripping and breaking your nose. Because it doesn't work. Okay? So, it's weak because it's working with our flesh. And then God had to do something. Sending His own Son in the likeness of the same sinful flesh that we're walking in. It looked like He was in sinful flesh, but He wasn't. Because sinful flesh doesn't really have anything to do with this. We've talked about this enough. Sinful flesh has everything to do with this black part. That's why I'm actually using colors. <laughs> As an offering for sin, he condemned sin where? In the flesh. And that's why you can be condemned when you're not in Christ. Because sin is condemned here. Condemnation runs rampant here. You want to make somebody feel really bad? Tell them they're an ugly, awful person. And it'll lodge here. And if they aren't walking in Christ, it will lodge here. It will stay here. And they, you might have only told them that they were an idiot one time. Out of anger. Out of frustration. Out of a moment of whatever. They'll replay that. Yep. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. What do you? I said it one time when I was angry. Come on. I've said this. Does it sound like I'm pretty good at it? All right. I've done this. But the person that heard it will replay it and replay it and replay it. Why? Because it lodges here. And if they're, if, if they're struggling in their flesh, if they're struggling to let go of this, it's like a recording. And you might have repented, you might have asked for forgiveness, but if the, if the flesh is still alive and strong, it's just like, play. You're an idiot. Play. You're an idiot. Play. You got me? It probably happened in some of our lives right here in this room. <coughs> Hopefully what this is doing is it's beginning to explain to you maybe some of the things that have happened in your life or how it actually does work. How this spirit, flesh, the real you, how this all works together. That's my goal in talking about this stuff. All right. In the likeness of sinful flesh, as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Jesus came to not destroy the law, but to fulfill. fulfill it. He says, let me show you. I'm going to fulfill the law for you. What none of us could do, he did. He walked in such a way where he fulfilled the entire law. Who do not walk. This is how the requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. We do not walk according to this, that recording that we keep hitting play, and believe we're an idiot, and believe we're stupid, or believe we're trash. That's what the flesh wants to tell us. Those of you that cannot walk, if you can work to yourself to not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Okay, there's a word there in verse 5 that I want to look up. And you think, most of us just blow by the word, but it's a really important word to me. And it's the word, in the NAS anyway, it's the word set. Do you guys have a different word there? For those who are according to the flesh, set. Does anybody else have a different word? Okay, everybody's got set. All right. So the word set in the Greek, or the original language, means to join with. It's not, it's not completely become one, but it's the process by which you become one. Okay? And the man and the wife join together and become what? One. One flesh. Okay? They join together. 
It's the same thing here. So, read it again, but read, use the word instead of set. Use the word join with. Those who are according to the flesh join their minds with the flesh. It's actually how it reads in the Greek. But those who are according to the Spirit join the things of the Spirit. Okay? So, this is what it looks like in our everyday life. This is you. This is you. Oh, this is awful. Okay. Okie dokie. That was like Cookie Monster. <laughs> the mind set or joined to the flesh. Is that what the first part says? Right? For those who are according to the flesh, join their minds to the things of the flesh. Okay? So, what happens here is basically what we do. And any kids in the room? Megan? Hey, you're old enough. You can handle this. Sexually speaking, we are the bride of Christ. Right? Okay. So, we open ourselves up to receive the Lord. You guys with me so far? All right. So, a woman opens herself up to receive a man. In the same way, the bride opens herself up. That's what this word means. To set, to join with, means that we open ourselves up in intimacy. Hmm. How do you become one? You open yourself up, ladies, and a man gives himself, and there's a joining that takes place. So what happens here, black. if we join ourselves to the flesh, then what begins to enter is all the things that have been recorded by the flesh, both from what people have said, from the law <laughs> of sin and death, from the cosmos, the wrong dimension. The dimension we're not supposed to draw from, we're actually supposed to shine light into, uh -huh. has now become a source. Do you know that the cosmos was never to be a source for humanity? It was supposed to be a place where we shine, where we give forth light. Instead, we open ourselves up and receive things from it we were never meant to receive. We actually become intimate with a prostitute. Oh. Something that was never supposed to be giving us anything. Okay? That's why I remember writing one time, I think it's a pretty powerful statement. Be careful what you become intimate with. Because you will have kids. If you become intimate with your flesh, I promise you, you were created to produce. Why? Just like a woman's created to produce. You give her a seed, her egg is, she's ovulating, she'll get, and she won't just give you something that small. Hello. She'll give you something big. Beautiful, intricate, gorgeous. This, I mean, a guy just gives this tiny little microscopic thing. And nine months later, we have, whoa. It's like peeing and pooping, and it's got eyes. And nose. <laughs> All I did was have a little fun one night, and I get this nine months later. Guys, it's the same thing in the flesh. It's the same thing in the spirit. When we are intimate with things like this, you will produce... Something that's not healthy. Oh, that's not good. That needs to be right. <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> Rewind. <laughs> I'm not even drawing it. I'm not sure how to draw it. Oh gosh, just that is just there! <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. All right. So that's what happened. This verse here, let it come alive to you. Those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Go to verse 6. Just jump. I, I just skipped because it's purposeful. For the mind set on the flesh is? Death. That's what it produces. This intimacy with the flesh produces death. Mm -hmm. That's the kid. That's the fruit of of a mind set on the flesh. So, if you want to hang out in your offense, if you want to hang out in the someone calling you an idiot back when you were four years old, or whatever it might have been that happened to you, you live in that long enough, the fruit of your life will be this. With me so far? Anything you're intimate with, you will produce fruit. Anything. That's something you want to write down, something you want to remember. Whatever you're intimate with, I don't care how strong you are, I don't care how much you think you got your act in order. I promise you, whatever you're intimate with, you will produce fruit with it. 
You have to. You were created by God to be fruitful and multiply. So, but it gets really good, okay? This is the bad part of how we were created. Here's the good part. Go back up to verse 5. But those who are according to the Spirit, our minds are joined to the things of the Spirit. So now, i got to redraw my cookie monster. Now we've got our mind again. And now we've got this. And our, we have been living in Christ not our mind set on the flesh. And so what happens is we break the power of the flesh and we begin to live by the Spirit. And before long, we're getting all of this input from a completely different realm, the realm we were always created to live by and from. Okay? Verse 6. But the mind set on the Spirit. What do we produce as a result of the mind set on the Spirit? Oh, baby. Say it with me. Life, Life and peace. Life and peace. peace. Mm -hmm. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Does that sound... And it, for, for us, we just went, oh, if we could just experience peace, oh, wouldn't it be great? There's something better than that. We're actually supposed to be people that created in the earth, that produce it, that spread it. Just like he, Jesus said, I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. It wasn't just so you could have it, Rich. It was so that you could create it and produce it and spill it out all over the place. Rivers of living water shall pool in you. No, shall flow from you. The whole point is this. When we live in Christ, we've broken the power of sin and death residing in our flesh. And now we have this new life flowing into us, into this place of intimacy. And now we have, oh yeah, we're producing fruit all right. Life Oh, baby. That's why Jesus came. Because he saw people that were created to do this creating that. We were perpetuating life. I'm sorry. Perpetuating death. Not because we were born sinful, but because we chose to live here instead of here. So God had to recreate the opportunity for us to live here. So he breaks the power of sin and death. He fulfills the law that perpetuated sin and death in us and breaks through and now gives us the opportunity for that. Oh, I just want to shout. <laughs> this is what we were created to be and do. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll shout alone. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. This is so good. Because the mind set on the flesh is what? Hostile. hostile. Have you ever met someone who was hostile? Mm -hmm. They're not fun to be around. Everything you say, they argue with. Everything you try to give them, they reject. Any kind of movement toward them, they read you wrong. They take it the opposite. Think about hostile. You even come near them, you know? You're like, before long, guess what you want to do? Not be around You just want to not be around them. You just want to stay away. Okay? That's what happens to a person whose mind's set on the flesh. But you don't, right? Huh? You don't. Not no, but when you're producing life and peace, something changes. Let's think about this. All right, so this is not scripture, but we're going to go off of this. So if we are the one in Christ, our mind's not set on the flesh, our mind is set on the spirit, we've broken through the flesh, we're, we're living this way, we produce life and peace, and we come against, or I shouldn't say that, we come into an environment where there's someone who's living by sin and death, and they're hostile. Who's greater? The one living. Greater is he that is in me. Here's what happens. When the, I'm giving you the end from the beginning. That's okay. Well, we're kind of in the middle. When this starts bringing life to us, it awakens original me. It awakens who we always were, the seed of Christ on the inside of us, the DNA that was holy from the moment we were designed, formed, fashioned, thought about. It empowers this guy. You know who's greater? This guy is greater than anything else in the world. Amen. So when this guy comes alive, Christ, us in Christ, encounters someone hostile toward God, watch out. Yep. You know, they might be able to fight you off for a little while, but eventually we're going to wear down this guy. 
Life and peace, life and peace, life. I can't take it. <laughs> okay, all right. Here's the problem. They encounter people that are also still living like that. People who are experiencing condemnation. One of the keys, that's why I think he starts out Romans 8 this way. If you're experiencing condemnation, you're probably not in Christ. If you're experiencing guilt, if you're experiencing this horrible sorrow about who you are, your mind is probably set on the flesh. Stop it, because you are a vessel of life and peace. I put you wherever you're going. Why? To pour this into the world, not more of this. I got plenty of this. I don't need my kids redeemed in my name producing this. Why are we still living according to the flesh? There's no reason to. The power's been broken. Sin and death has been defeated. Yet we choose this. Hmm. It's ridiculous. And that's why the heavenly perspective is, I don't get it. I can actually, if I were them, I'd be like, I don't know. Man. They have everything. They got it all. Why do they still choose offense? Why do they still choose whatever it might be? You with me? All right. Uh, yeah. The mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it, it is not even able to do so. You can't. The flesh cannot subject itself to the law of the Spirit. You must cause the law of the Spirit to come in, and then it dies, and the flesh dies. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. The flesh cannot submit itself to God. It cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Oh, I always please God. How many people have heard that? I always please God. I'm always, you know what? He loves original you. He loves the guy in the flesh. But the guy in the flesh does not bring him pleasure. He can love it. In fact, he does. I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago. I even watched the part of the video where I did this, so I'm going to do it again. He so loved the world, right, that he wraps it all up in his love and squeezes it, squeezes it, squeezes it, squeezes it until out comes the original you. And in the process, he has to love all of this. He has to love the flesh you, the sin and death you. He just wraps it all up. For God so loved the world. Death, sin, all of this awful, ugly stuff. He had to love it all so he could redeem it. What's the redemption? Releasing this guy. So he swallows it all up, squeezes it until you come out. The real you. He had always intended you to. Okay. So then, you know, so we can have in, in pieces of all that, right? And we can time, have both of these I mean, going on at the same time. Like we're multi, multiple personalities. And what does James say about a double-minded man? He's unstable. unstable in all his ways. This is the double-minded man. When you've got arrows going both ways. When you've got black coming in and you've got red coming in. Your mind's kind of like, oh, oh, I don't know what to do. I, don't know if, I, I just won't do anything. But you I, I have to eventually get to there to get to the, like, isn't it a process? Yeah. yeah how do you not like, have one without the other? Huh? How do you not have one yeah. without the other? You do. You will have one with the other. But here's the point. Greater is, we got to go back to this. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, let's go back and read this. I just I need you guys to see this. We just read all this. For the law, verse 2, Romans 8, verse 1. Who needs a highlighter? If anybody asks this question, or you don't have a highlighter because you have electronic. Okay. For the law <laughs> of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. Say it with me. Free. Set you free from the law of sin and death. Here's what happens. Corinne, great question. This is what happens. You have to let the flow from the Spirit stop. Just a trickle will begin to drive this out. There will be a season of time where this is coming in and this is still coming in, and there is a double-mindedness and an unstableness. Has anybody ever experienced a season like that? Okay? Where you've got life of God flowing into you, and you're kind of like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, life could be like this, and then, oh, life sucks, it's awful. I just want to die. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You're like, you're like this schizophrenic. I don't know who I am. All right? It's in that moment that you better be walking with the Father. Yeah. When you are unstable in all your ways, you need to be walking with people that have kind of already battled this 
overcome it and are walking much more in the Spirit in Christ. Because you know what? Every one of us needs shored up. Every, if you try to do that, this season is actually worse than all sin and death. 